Okay, uh, we're going to uh, continue on here. Chapter two, why not? Seems good. So last time we talked about uh, chapter two stuff. <laughs> there that might be. Uh, let's see. We did uh, measurements, I believe. So last time we talked about uh, how to take measurements, how to take proper measurements. Remember that when you do take a measurement, there's really two things that you want to really look at. Uh, which you might do this week, I think, in lab as well. Uh, you want to look at your scale. So once again, depending on the piece of equipment that you're using, you want to always look at the actual scale that's on that equipment that you're using to make the measurement. Remember that even if it happens to be, for example, the uh, sort of same... Say if it's a graduated cylinder, same volume of graduated cylinder that somebody else may have. Uh, again, if it was made by somebody else, the markings may be different. So you want to always make sure that you look at it. There's really two types of markings that you really want to be able to identify so that you could correctly make a measurement. Uh, the first one is what is really referred to a lot of times as the large markings. And those are usually the markings that have numbers next to them. Uh, so in this particular case, the difference between sort of the markings, large markings that have numbers is one centimeter. Then really the other thing that you want to look at is how many sort of small markings there are between the two large markings. So when we count the small markings, it's important to start counting after the last sort of large marking. So in this case, we would start counting here. And that'll be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And that is ten markings between basically one centimeter in this particular case. So if you're not really sure how much that is, uh, you basically take the one centimeter and divide it by ten, which is the number of markings there are. And that will tell you that really each of the smaller markings represent 0.1 of a centimeter, basically. So this guy here would be 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.4, 1 1.5, 1 1.6, 1 1.7, 1 1.8, 1 1.9, and then obviously up to two centimeters in this particular case. So when you do take a measurement, as we talked about, there should always be some numbers that no matter who takes a look at it, you know, everybody really should sort of agree that it's at least this much in terms of the measurement. Obviously, here in the arrow that I just drew, everybody should agree it is at least 1.5. Uh, I laid up just before the 1.6 marking there, so it's not exactly 1.6. So uh, 1.5 is definitely what I referred to as all the certain numbers. And when you do make a measurement, you always want to record all those certain numbers. And with any type of measurement, there really is some type of uncertainty. And that in this particular case is if we just kind of like pop the thing right about there, uh, we could see that it's actually not at the 1.6. And like you said before, it's past the 1.5. So this is really where sort of the uncertainty or the estimation has to come into play when we take this measurement. Now, in this particular case, it does seem to me to be past halfway to that point. Uh, so what I mean by that, obviously, it seems to be halfway between those two markings at least halfway and a little bit more. So in this particular case, you may call it like 1.57 as it's kind of close to the 1.6 marking. And this would be what is sometimes referred to as the first uncertain number. And obviously we always want to include our units when we do that. And whenever you take a particular measurement, you should always record all of the certain numbers plus that very first uncertain number uh, when you take a proper did, uh, measurement. As we also talked about, that really is what uh, sort of significant figures are. And that would mean in this particular case, this guy would have three significant figures. The uncertain number in this case, again, being that seven. Usually we're thinking of like it's, you know, kind of plus or minus one of that uncertain digit or that estimated digit. So basically what you're saying when you record something like this is 
I think it's 1.57, but, you know, maybe it's like 1.58, maybe it's like 1.56. And once again, if you kind of look at the scaling and what we got going on, that's pretty reasonable in terms of how far we could go in this particular case. Um, typically speaking, as we talked about, you usually are able to go one more place to the right of the smallest marking. So the smallest markings in this case is 0.1 you have the ability to go one more place to the right when you take your measurement and we could take it to two decimal places. If you want to kind of know for sure how far you should take your reading and you feel really confident that you're able to identify uh, the smallest markings in terms of what they represent, all you have to do is take the smallest markings divided by two. And in this case here, uh, we will end up with something like this, which is two decimal places. And that is how far we should take the reading to. So uh, if you want to kind of verify that maybe you're taking the reading correctly, in general, that usually is one more place to the right of the smallest marking. But if you can easily or for sure identify the smallest marking, you can just divide it by two. And whatever it comes to, one decimal place, that's how far you should take the reading, two decimal places. You know, does it come to a whole number? I think we might have looked at uh, this the other day. You know, if we had something like. No, in this particular case, uh, our large marking is 10 milliliters. We have uh, one, two, three, four and five markings in between. In this case, if we take 10 divided by five, each of our small markings is two milliliters in this case. And that would make this guy 12, 14, 16, 18. So again, if we do end up here, we're between 16 and 18. And I think as we talked about, really between 16 and 18 in this case is 17 milliliters, which would actually have two significant figures. And again, like I was talking about, if you know that the small marking is two, milliliters, you could divide it by two, that equals one milliliter. That's a whole number. That's where you should take your reading to in this particular case. So again, it does vary depending on the scale. You want to make sure that you can identify that. You always want to take the reading to the proper number of digits. I think we also talked about the idea that, let's just say we extended my line to exactly uh, the 1.6 marking, for example, on this one. We do need to record 1.60 centimeters in this case. This would be our certain numbers. This would be our uncertain number or the estimated digit. And this would have three significant figures because we have the ability on this particular scale to go to the second decimal place. We do have to go to the second decimal place. I think we did something similar to this. You know, if you just did 1.6, that would be two significant figures. And this is the uncertain digit. And that's a great amount of error. That's basically saying, I think it's 1.6, but it's anywhere between 1.5 and 1.7, which is a huge amount of error. When in reality, on this particular scale, you have the ability to say, I think it's 1.60, which means it could be 1.61 or 1.59, which is a super small range of error, right? So it's really important that you don't, as we talked about, sort of lop off any sort of significant figures uh, because what you're really doing in that case is making your measurement pretty uh, worse and a pretty worse measurement, a lot more errors introduced there. Just like you should not uh, sort of lop off a significant figure, uh, you shouldn't add one either if you don't have the ability to do it. So adding zeros just to make it kind of better in a sense is not really appropriate if you don't have the ability based on what you're using to do that. So, you know, by adding zeros, you're making it actually a better measurement than it really is if your equipment can't go that. So if your equipment, for example, can only go to the first decimal place and you add an extra zero, you're saying it's much better piece of equipment than it is. And you don't really have that ability to do that. So it actually works both ways. You shouldn't really lop off any sort of numbers and you shouldn't add extra numbers that shouldn't be there. That's why it's important to look at the scaling and make sure that you give the reading to you based on the scale that's there, the proper number of digits. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> that led us to, I think, a conversation about significant figures officially. 
And remember that uh, there are some rules for counting significant figures, which I think is where we kind of left off. Uh, remember that uh, all non-zeros are significant. Uh, so any non-zero number that you have would be a significant figure. So this number here would have three significant figures. Remember, bless you, when we are counting significant figures, uh, we always go left to right. We always start with the very first non-zero. That's always where you should start counting. And obviously you continue on. It is the zeros that, you know, there are three different types of zeros that we come across. And some zeros are significant, some are not significant. So again, it's really important to understand which ones are which. Uh, there are leading zeros. And those are not significant. And those are really all the zeros that come before you hit the very first non-zero number. So all these zeros here are not going to be significant. Once again, we really don't start counting our significant figures until we hit the first non-zero, which in this case is our four. And then obviously our two and our two. And that would mean that this guy's got three significant figures, which would be those guys at the end. There's a captive zero, a trapped zero, whatever you want to call it. And those are significant. And those are zeros that are between two non-zero numbers. Uh, so if you got four, zero, 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 three, again, we would start counting here. All three of these zeros are trapped between two non-zeros, which makes them significant. And our guy at the end is significant. Uh, so we're looking at five significant figures in this particular case. And then really the sort of zero that gets people into, I'll say most trouble, but is sort of troublesome for a lot of people is the trailing zeros. And those trailing zeros are significant if there is a decimal point written in the number. Now, that's really important, especially when you're counting significant figures and you're counting zeros at the end. A decimal point does have to be actually written in the number. It can't just be assumed like, you know, it's at the end or something like that. So you do have to kind of see the decimal point actually written in the number. And if you do see it written in the number, then any zero that comes at the end would be considered significant. If you do not have a decimal point written in the number, uh, then those zeros at the end would not be significant. Uh, so if you had something like 0 0.43200, here we would not count this guy. We would start counting here at the four. The three and the two are non-zero, so they're significant. And here at the end, these are trailing zeros at the end of the number. They are going to be significant in this case because there is a decimal point over there in the number. Again, it doesn't have to be right next to those zeros. Just needs to be somewhere in that number. And uh, I want to say five on that looks like a winner there. And that would be five significant figures. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Remember that I think we also talked about that if you write a number in scientific notation, Always, when you see a number of scientific notation, all the numbers that come before the times 10 part are significant figures. So they are significant figures. And I might have mentioned it last time, but I'll mention again here. Uh, there is certain cases where you do a calculation and you need to give your answer to the specific number of significant figures. And there really is kind of no way to do that in regular form, if you will, decimal notation, decimal form, positional notation, like a regular number. There's no way to write a regular number and have the right number of significant figures in certain cases. And that's where uh, scientific notation can come in handy. You really can control how many significant figures you need by writing in a certain way. And uh, because again, like if we wanted three significant figures and this was our number, we could just write it like that. We just needed two significant figures. We would drop the zero and write it like that. That would be two significant figures. That would be three significant figures. 
Heck, if we needed four, you could add another zero to uh, the first one and you would have four. So sometimes if you find yourself at an answer after we talk about sort of doing calculations with significant figures um, and you're like, I just don't know how to get that number just like regularly written to the right number, uh, it is possible that the only way to do it is using scientific notation. Again, you do not need for me personally to give your answers in scientific notation uh, unless it says to do so, obviously. Um, but you do need to give things to the right number of significant figures and stuff like that. So again, sometimes the only way to do that is that situation. Any questions on that stuff there? I think we might have talked about, it, but if not, we'll talk about it here. We'll probably see it again in a second. But uh, there's also exact numbers, uh, which are really not significant figures. For the most part, significant figures really do come from sort of measurements and those type of values. Uh, exact numbers, on the other hand, are one of two things. Uh, they're either something that's going to be counted or uh, they're a definition like you know, 12 inches is equal to one foot, something like that. Um, that's what's called an equality or a definition. Uh, something that's counted, again, like if I had some pens up here on the desk, I'm not going to do any type of uh, experiment to figure out how many pens I have. I'm just going to simply count them. Uh, so anything that's counted like that, if you got like three baseballs on the table, you're just going to count the three baseballs, right? You're not going to do any kind of measurement really other than one, two, three. So those are really... Uh, what are considered exact numbers. Now, the deal with exact numbers and sort of significant figures is exact numbers can have any amount of significant figures you want. So it could have as many significant figures as you want. And what that really means, as we'll talk about when we get into some of these calculations, is when we do calculations that involve any type of exact number, we really don't have to worry about those numbers in terms of our answer, in terms of what our answer should be, how many significant figures our answer should end up with. So when we have an exact number that we use in a calculation, because it could have as many significant figures as you want, we kind of ignore it in terms of the calculation, in terms of helping us decide what our answer should end up with in terms of significant figures. Any questions on any of that there? <clears throat> All right. So I think we... Uh, there's sort of stuff we just talked about. All right. So here again, a couple more examples here. Counting significant figures, 38.15. Again, starting on the left here, that is where we start counting. They're all non-zero. So we got four significant figures. We got two significant figures, three significant figures, and five significant figures as they are all there. The other thing that we also talked about, again, is remember that the uncertain number or the estimated digit is not always going to necessarily be the last number that's written, but it should be the last significant figure written. So for example, right, I think we might have looked at this guy last time. If I have 12,000, that has how many significant figures? It does have two. Only the one and the two here are significant. There's no decimal point written, so those zeros at the end are not significant. The estimated digit in this case is it is the two in this case, right? It's not the last one. Uh, so that is where the uncertainty lies or the estimation lies. And again, that means you have a pretty big room for error there, 13,000 or 11,000 as you go through it. Uh, here, looking at some of these, as we talked about zeros trapped, that's going to trap those zeros being significant. So we got four, three. Again, we're not going to start counting until the seven in that particular case. So that's going to be three significant figures. And here we won't start counting until the four, which is our first significant figure. Again, these zeros here are leading zeros, so they don't count. Now, sometimes people have this question, which is, you know, uh, this has a decimal point, and this is like a zero that comes after the decimal point. Shouldn't that be significant? And the answer is no, because as we go left to right here, both of these zeros would be considered a leading zero because you have not started counting technically until you hit the seven in this particular case. So again, even though you have a bunch of zeros that may come after the decimal point, if they come after a decimal point, but before the first non-zero, they're still leading zeros and they are not counted. So if you had something like this, 
all of these guys, including all these zeros, are all leading zeros because, again, we would not start counting until we hit the three in this case. And that means the three and the two here would be significant, and we would have two significant figures in this case. Any questions on that there? <laughs> And then our, again, our zeros here at the end, we need that decimal point here we do not have. So it is our two here uh, that is our one significant figure. By the way, the two here is also our estimated digit in this case, as that is where the error lies. Again, in that case, you're saying, I think it's 200, could be 100 or 300. Again, a pretty big room for error. Again, the more digits you have, right, the kind of better measurement it is. There's less uncertainty, less kind of room for uncertainty, right? If you have only like one significant figure, you have a pretty big room for error that's probably going to happen in that case. Here with the decimal point here, that is the four, which is where we start counting. All three of these zeros are going to be significant. All three of those zeros are considered trailing zeros at the end. There's no other number that comes after them. And again, they're going to be significant because there is that decimal point uh, in that number. Any questions on there? <clears throat> and again, a couple of other zeros at the beginning. And so we got our three, which would be here, our two, and our one in that case. All right. And obviously here, no decimal. Two, two, three in terms of significant figure. Once again, the uncertain digit here on the first one is this four, right? The uncertain digit on this one is the one, and the uncertain or estimated digit on this one is the five. Again, all examples, that is not the last number in this particular case, as those zeros at the end are not significant. They're really just there to keep the value of the number what it should be, right? So, you know, if we took something like 44,000, and we go, oh, these aren't significant. We'll just drop it. Now we have 44, although that is still two significant figures. Again, there's a very big difference between the meaning of 44 and the meaning of 44,000, right? So we need to keep those zeros there for placeholders to keep the magnitude of the number correct. But again, it is not significant. They're just kind of keeping the number value correct. Any questions on that there? All right, and as we talked about, again, any number before the time send part, significant. So three, two, and five. By the way, a very common error that people make when they're asked, for example, how many significant figures a number has, and what they do is, uh, you know, they get a number and they turn it into like a sort of decimal or regular sort of number and they go oh three places this way one two three uh so one two three and then they go oh it's like four right and it's not it actually is still two so when you have a number written in scientific notation and you want to know how many significant figures it has it is how it's written in scientific notation is how many significant figures it has. Don't turn it into a number and then try to figure out how many it is. Just do it based on that. By the way, when you do turn a number from scientific notation to regular form and backwards, you should never lose any significant figures, which means the way I wrote this actually is correct because it still has two significant figures in both places. I would not want to put this because then how many significant figures does that have? This will now have four significant figures, so you don't want to do that. So, um, again, you don't want to gain significant figures or lose significant figures as you go from scientific notation to uh, decimal form and back and forth. So you always want to maintain the right number of significant figures. All right. All right, so take a moment here. Identify the significant, non-significant series. So how many significant figures are there in each Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, we'll start the first one. Remember, always left to right. We do not want to start counting until we hit the very first non-zero, which in this case is our two. A six, a five, and the zero at the end. Is it significant? It is because there is a decimal point, which makes this one significant. So this guy's got uh, four significant figures in this case, and it obviously would be this part right here. 
Now we do want to write it into scientific notation. So this is going to be 2.650 times 10. Uh, I'll go on top. One, two, three. That's going to be negative three in this case. I do need to keep all of these numbers, right? Because now it has four significant figures here to match the four significant figures that it originally had. Again, we cannot just get rid of the zero there. Otherwise, it would only have three, and we lost a significant figure along the way. Coming to the next one here, starting to count. Counts. Trapped, so counts. So it looks like all are significant here. So we got five significant figures. So again, here we go. One, two, three. I don't know we when it dies. That's 43. We'll start here where the decimal it is. And now we go one place. Uh, 4.3026. But it happens when you scribble all over the place. Uh, times 10 to the 1 in this case. Once again here, we do need to keep all of these numbers. So we maintain our significant figures here of 5, I think, in that case. <laughs> Question on that one there. Sort of raise it. The opposite direction? I'm sorry? It goes from left to right. B. It, and it goes left to right in terms of I mean, right to left because you went the opposite way. You put the decimal in between the four. Yeah, so remember when we do write a, a number in scientific notation, um, this part has to be a number uh, between one and ten, so it can't be ten. So if we went to the right, we would end up with like four thirty, right? So if we go to the left, we end up with four point three. So. In the case up here on the first one, we did actually have to go to the right to get it, again, a number between 1 and 10. It could be 1 point something. It can't be 10 point something, nor can it be less than 1. So that's why we had to keep going until we got that one. Other questions? <clears throat> here, uh, we assume the decimal points here. Uh, but before we do that, this actually has four significant figures. There is not a decimal point actually written in this number. So these zeros at the end are not significant. Uh, so we've got four significant figures. Now, in terms of scientific notation, we do assume, I should be better and put some units on this. Uh, we assume that the decimal is here, even though it's not written. So we do need to go one place, two places, three places, four places, five places, and six places in this case. And that gets us uh, 1.044 times 10 to the six liters. Here, this has four significant figures. We actually do need to drop the zeros here when we go scientific notation. Otherwise, if we kept them, uh, we would have a lot more than uh, four. We'd have something like seven significant figures, which would be too many. So again, this is why in certain cases you may, if you're kind of going into scientific notation, you may drop some zeros because they're not significant. But if you keep them in scientific notation, you're saying they are significant. So now you have two different numbers of significant figures. Yeah. If say one more time, if you, you wrote the zeros. Okay. so if you wrote technically uh, one point oh four four zero 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 times ten to the six liters, is that what you're asking? But yeah, it technically would be wrong in the sense of significant figures, because when you write this number like that, you're telling everybody that all these are significant, where these three zeros really are not significant in our original number. So somehow by just rewriting scientific notation, it just gained three more significant figures, which is not so great. So uh, you always want to, again, make sure you maintain the same number of significant figures as you go kind of back and forth between scientific notation and uh, decimal form. Other questions? Okay. Yeah. I went uh, six uh, because we do need a number between one and 10 when we do scientific notation. Uh, so for example, if you look at this number, one, zero, four, four, zero, 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 we assume the decimal is here. So if we just go one place, uh, we're at like 104,000, right? You go one more place, you're at like uh, we got there 10,000, still not a number. So you got to keep going. We stop here at 104, which is not a number between one and 10. So you got to keep, you can't stop here because this is 10 point something. So it's got to be less than 10. So you got to keep going one more until you get to that number between one and 10. Yeah. Other questions? <laughs> yeah. If you are going to turn that number into scientific notation, yeah. So it's normal. So there's two things you got to kind of keep straight in, in the sense of that. Uh, if you're just simply going to turn that number into scientific notation, 
we typically assume, even though it's not written in there, that the decimal point's at the end, right? If there's no decimal point written. Now, if you're just simply looking at the number and want to know how many significant figures there are, if the decimal point is not written, then you don't assume it's there. So we just kind of assume it's there to turn it into scientific notation. So we kind of know where to start moving our decimal point. Other questions? <clears throat> all right, there's all that, perfect. All right, so we talked a little about exact numbers, which again, are really obtained through counting or any type of definition. Again, if you had eight cookies, or two baseballs, you're just going to count how many you have. These are definitions or what are sometimes referred to as equalities. And equalities are a fancy word that basically means they are two values that are in different units, but they represent the same amount of something. So that's the same sort of distance. One foot is the same as 12 inches. If you had $1, that's the same as 100 pennies in terms of the amount of money it is, right? Just sort of different units. And that's what equalities are. Uh, two different scales uh, that uh, represent the same amount of something. Now, if you remember, we talked about units, and there's kind of two types of units. Uh, there's the English or U.S., I think your book might use. And there's the metric system. And when we talk about exact numbers, if you're doing some type of conversion between a English to English unit, that's definitely an exact number. So you don't have to worry about it. If you're doing really a metric to metric conversion, that also is considered an exact number and definition. There's really kind of only one place where if you're using some type of conversion that actually crosses over. So you're doing some type of metric to English type of unit or backwards English to metric. Uh, these are typically not exact numbers. And you do actually have to take into account the significant figures that are there when you do calculations. There are a few exceptions. The most notable exception is one inch is exactly 2.54 centimeters. So that is an exact conversion between metric and English, English being inches, uh, metric being centimeters, and that's an exact conversion. But typically speaking, for example, if you just use this sort of number, like 454 grams equals one pound, that is uh, metric to English, and those are not considered usually an exact sort of value. Now, if you use like 453.6, that's more closer to an exact number, but uh, you would have to sort of take into account the significant figures here. So uh, definitely it's a uh, sort of no-brainer in terms of do you have to worry about the significant figures? If you see it's an English-to-English -English conversion or a metric-to-metric, -metric, it's just like going to be an exact number. If it's one inch equals 2.54 centimeters, it's going to be an exact number. But you should start to maybe think about it when we start doing calculations. If you see it's kind of a metric to English and it's not one of those sort of exact ones, you may have to a lot of times take into account the uh, significant figures. So this would be classified as a metric to metric conversion. And obviously that's an English to English sort of conversion. So those would both be uh, considered exact numbers. As I mentioned before, exact numbers pretty much have unlimited number of significant figures. And really the idea here is uh, for the most part, we just sort of ignore them in calculations because I may say it has five, somebody else may say it has three because you could use as many as you want. And it's because of that, we just sort of ignore, we don't ignore the number in the calculation, but we ignore it in terms of helping us decide where we should get our answer or end our answer in terms of that. So here again is metric to metric conversions. All these would be considered exact numbers. Uh, all these are English to English uh, ones, which would be considered exact numbers as well. So if we look at this, three coins would be a exact number, right? You're just gonna count that. The diameter of a circle is 7.902. That is going to be a measured number, right? Uh, some type of measurement that was done. By the way, how many significant figures would it have? It does have four significant figures. Uncertain number, estimated number here is? Is it two, right? So it's that one. 
this would be considered it would be considered exact right there is 60 minutes in one hour by the way there's how many seconds in a minute how many hours in a day all right not 60 all right let's go see that on exam sometimes people go like 60 seconds in a minute 60 minutes in an hour 60 hours in a day too many hours way too many hours all right, let's go with uh, how many significant figures what we got here on the first one. We do have two, right? So again, not going to start counting until we get to here. Uh, so that is going to be significant. Again, the zero at the end will be significant because of the decimal point that's there. Uh, so it's these last two, the uncertain numbers that last zero. So that would be two significant figures. This next guy would have, it would have four. Again, we would start counting here. All these are significant. Once again, that guy at the end going to be significant because there is a decimal point there. So that is four significant figures. C has, it does have one. Once again, even though all these zeros come after a decimal point, we really don't start counting until we hit that eight. And then we're out of numbers at that point, which means we have one significant figure. The uncertain number here is, it is the eight in this case, right? So uh, and lastly, D would be, it would be three significant. This going to be significant because of the decimal point here, uh, which would be three significant figures. Any questions on any of those there? All right, so take a moment and answer these. Which answer contains three significant figures? Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, we'll start with the first one here. Which answer contains three significant figures? Well, the first one here has how many? This first one has four, right? Uh, second one has, that looks like a winner of that. And the last one here has four. Yeah, all right. So number two looks good. Uh, we're looking for all the zeros being significant. Which one is all the zeros significant? Two. Any other ones? No? Okay, let's see. Uh, so uh, this has how many significant figures this first number? It does have three, these guys, which means this zero is significant. These are not, right? So that's not good. This has a decimal, which makes these significant, right? So those are significant. How many significant figures does this number have? It has... It has four. It's written in scientific notation, right? Are all those zeros written there significant? That's both answers. Which one was right, you think? They are significant in this case, right? So I can go three as well. Yeah, that one has zeros that are significant as well in this case. Remember, we look at it in scientific notation, which means that they are significant here. Uh, question on that there. <laughs> now, uh, the number here has three significant figures, right? Again, all the numbers before the times 10 part are significant. Be there. Any question on any of those? All right. All right. So now that we know how to count significant figures, let's talk about how we use them in calculations or how to properly uh, use them in calculations. Um, I think in the first chapter, we talked about punching in scientific notation, obviously, into your calculator. Uh, remember that just like your calculator doesn't necessarily uh, give you an answer necessarily in scientific notation, uh, your calculator may not give you your answer in the correct number of significant figures, right? So you might have to do some adjusting there in terms of that. But before we get into the actual rules of doing the calculations, let's talk about also a really important thing, which is rounding. And when we round numbers, we want to make sure that we round correctly. So normal rules apply with rounding, which means if it's four or less uh, next to the number where you want to round it to, uh, you basically just drop those numbers. Uh, if it's five or more, that next number to where you want to kind of stop and round, uh, you then round up, right? So normal rounding rules. So if I have... Uh, 
13,333, and I want two significant figures. The answer is 13. 13.0. That makes it nicer. Again, let's just add some zeros and see. Let's go with like 13. All right. So I've got a variety of uh, numbers here. So uh, let's start with how many significant figures. So this guy has two. Yeah. This one has three. So that's not good, right? Since we're going for two, right? So that's definitely not going to be good. How about this one? This one has? This one does have two significant figures, which is that, right? All right. Well, they both have two, but they both can't be the right answer, correct? So if I owed you, right? $13,333. And I tell you, I'm just going to pay you two significant figures. Here's $13. Are you going to be happy with me? Probably not, right? There is a very big difference in the meaning of like $13,333. And here's like 13 bucks. We're good, right? No problem. High five, walk out the door. <laughs> Probably run out the door quicker would be a better move. So we never want to do that. We never want to do extreme rounding. And it happens a lot. And it happens because uh, people are always told, get it to the right number of significant figures. So in their head, there's like two, two. And it's like, forget all the numbers. We're just going to get rid of them all and just make sure I just got two numbers written. We're good. So you don't want to do that. So this would obviously be incorrect. You never, ever want to change the meaning of the number when you round. Uh, you just want to make sure you get the right number of significant figures and keep the meaning. This is not bad. That's 13,000, which is pretty much the same amount as 13,333. Maybe I get like a $333 teacher discount, whatever it may be there. Uh, but we're really not changing the meaning of it. We also could do a little scientific notation, perhaps, right? 1.3 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4. That also would be two significant figures, right? And still maintain the value. So it's really important not to go crazy with the rounding in the effort to get the right number of significant figures. It's important to get the right number of significant figures, but don't go crazy with the rounding. The other thing about rounding is this, if you are doing a multiple calculations, so you got a bunch of calculations you're gonna do kind of in a row to get to an answer at the end, so maybe, you know, you do a calculation, you get this number, you take that number, do another calculation, get that number, take that number, do another calculation. And maybe you're doing three, four calculations kind of in a row. It's really important in most cases not to round to the very end. Yeah, it's important as we'll talk about to kind of keep track of, you know, your calculation and where you should end up. But I would not round until the very end. I would keep a few extra digits. Sometimes people call them guard digits. You keep a couple extra digits so you don't get rounding errors. If you like had like a three-step calculation like there on top and you did like strict rounding every single time you got an answer and then took that answer and did the calculation, strictly rounded it, got the answer and strictly rounded it, uh, you'd probably be fairly far off the correct answer. And they call that rounding error uh, where you just kind of every time you round a little bit, you're moving further and further away from kind of the right answer. I personally, when I do calculations and there's lots of steps, I try to keep like the whole number and just roll with it in my calculator. Uh, if you need to write it down, go a few extra places, but you should clean it up at the very end. And that's usually the good way of sort of rounding. Uh, you should think about where you need to end up in terms of your answer, uh, but I would hold off on the strict rounding until you get to the very end. Any questions on that there? All right, so obviously here, if we wanna go three significant figures on this one, uh, three would be to the two. We would look at the three and just drop it, and we end up with 8.42. If we're going to two significant figures, that's the four. We would look at the next number over, which is a two, and drop it to gives us 8.4. Here are the three significant figures would be to the seven. The eight is the next number, which means we should round up. So that's how we get to 14.8 here. And obviously, if we're going to two, which would be the four, we would look at the seven and also round up to 15 in this case. So again, uh, you may need to round up or down. Here, we're gonna go to three. We need to look at the six and we round up. In this case, three, two, five, three, two, six, and zero. I kept a zero because if I dropped a zero, what happened? 
If I dropped to zero, I went from 3,260 to 326, right? Again, a big difference in the meaning of those two numbers. So here we do have to keep the zero again to maintain what the number represents. Would I want to put a decimal point after that uh, zero in this case? I would not because then I would have how many significant figures? I would have four significant figures. In this case, I'm looking for three and that wouldn't be good. So again, we want to think about these things before we just kind of randomly put decimal points down right or zeros. You know, we want to make sure we're not messing the significant figures up by making perhaps the number look prettier with some dots and stuff like that. So counting our third significant figure in this case would be the four. Uh, that means we do need to look at the five. And since that's five or above, we're going to round up in this case. And that should give me 3.15 in this case, right? Again, we don't want to keep a zero or anything like that because then we would have four significant figures in this case. Now we want to go to two significant figures. Uh, in that case, two significant figures would actually be the one in this case. We would then look at the four, which is less than five. We just drop it and 3.1 in this case. So any questions on either of those? All right. <clears throat> All right, so we want uh, three significant figures in each of these. Let's see what you come up with. Left to right, third significant figure is right there at the four. Uh, we would go to the seven. We should round up, and that's going to be an 825 centimeters in this case. Yeah. Uh, so the next one, third significant figure is going to be the two in this case. We would then look at the four and it's less than five. So we're just going to drop it 0 0.122 grams. And three significant figures on the next one is where? To the right of the three. Yeah, that would be three significant figures. Uh, it's actually not written there, right? It'd be right about there, I suppose, right? Yeah, so uh, we might need to add a zero in this case, right, to make it into three significant figures. It doesn't really change the meaning of the number, right, but it does change the number of significant figures here by putting the zero here, and we actually need to add it. Yeah, so it would be there. So again, as we've talked about, there are situations where you do need to perhaps add a zero. There are places where you might need to get rid of zeros. You just want to make sure you do it correctly. Do you have a question, sir? uh it is uh so it's like it should be like a one it's kind of like a it's kind of like a two if you add one more to it you know i'll just do you know i'm just going to say the classic course i did that to make sure you're paying attention i didn't screw up <laughs> it felt like right in a two you're right thank you very much to be yeah the number shouldn't change either probably unless you you know screw up like i just did there so point one one two uh again three significant figures and again we need to add the uh, zero other questions on that? All right. So let's talk a little about actually uh, when we do calculations with significant figures and sort of what our answers should look like. So there's really kind of uh, two groups of math operations that you do. So one type of operation is either you're multiplying or you're dividing. And if you do any type of calculation where you multiply or divide, what we're looking for in terms of what our answer should end up as is uh, the number of the number with the least number of significant figures is what your answer should have in terms of significant figures. So if you're multiplying numbers like 1.20 times 3336, three, three, we're multiplying. So we want to look at significant figures of each of these numbers. Uh, this first one has how many significant figures? The 1.20 is 3. The 3336 three, is 4. So the smallest number of significant figures in this case is 3. So our answer should end up with 3 significant figures. So if I put in my made up number here on my calculator, my calculator spits out to me 4003.2.
That means that my answer in this case should be what? Where is the third significant figure here? It is that zero right there. That means that we need to look to the right there and I should technically drop that thing, right? Because it's less than five, which means, is that the correct answer? That is not, that is how many significant figures? One. Can I write 4,000 in a decimal form that has three significant figures? The answer is, no, you cannot. There's no possible way to keep it at 4,000 and write it as a decimal. That means in this case, I actually need to write it which way? I do have to use scientific notation. So making up those numbers actually worked here. So uh, here, there is really no way to give our answer to three significant figures in posi positional notation or regular form. We do have to move it in one, two, three places. And I need how many zeros here? I need two times 10 to the three. Now I have the correct magnitude and the correct number of significant figures in this particular case. So this is what I was talking about earlier. Sometimes when you do a calculation, there is no way to sort of write it in regular number form to get the right number of significant figures. Again, in this case, just so we're clear, I could not write 400 point, right? 400 point because that would mean that's 400, which is very different than 4,000, right? If I put a decimal point at the end of 4,000, I have four significant figures. Again, there is no way to get it to three without doing scientific notation in this case. Same thing if you're dividing or multiplying, you always look at significant figures and your answer should always have the least number of significant figures are equal to the number that has the least number of significant figures. The reason for that is, frankly, it is your worst measurement. Your worst measurement has the least number of significant figures. So your calculation is only as good as your worst measurement. And in that case, that would be it. Here, we're actually doing a bunch of things together, which means you do have to kind of keep track of what you're doing. So for example, if we were going to do this math, we actually would do the top part first, right? And then the top part we're multiplying, which means we should look at significant figures. This guy has two significant figures. This guy has four significant figures, right? The zero would be significant. That means if I get an answer for the top part, it should have how many significant figures? It should have two significant figures, right? If you got that answer. So again, if you have popped that into your calculator there, 2.8 times 67.40, technically you would have a number like 188.72. Technically speaking, this number should end right about there. I am not going to round at this point, as we talked about, because I am not done with my calculation, right? The next thing I need to do is take that top number and now divide it by the bottom number, right? So my top number should have two significant figures. Sorry, actually, it should end here. That's my bad spot there. It should end there at two significant figures. Uh, so that number on top should end at two significant figures. And my bottom number has three significant figures, right? So I'm going to take this 34.8. My answer should end up with two significant figures, right? Again, you want to keep track of it. So again, I would take the whole number there. I would divide it by 34.8. Again, as you can see, this is what you get on your calculator, not the correct number of significant figures but we should end up at two and we would round it to 5.4 in this case. So you do want to keep track of it. And although I originally marked the wrong one there on top, there should have been the first eight, uh, which would be the second significant figure. I would not round at that point. So I would not strictly round the top number, but I do want to keep track of it as you do multiple steps. Question on that. So if you multiply or divide is significant figures, it's always the one with the least number of significant figures. Now, when we, yeah, we'll do that one here. So here, if we divide this, the calculator again gives us four, but in terms of significant figures, I'll grab the real pin. 
Uh, that is three significant figures and three significant figures, which means our answer should have three. So here we do need to add the zeros to give us the right number of significant figures in this case. Again, it does not change the meaning of that particular number. All right, so try this one here, see what you come up with. Okay, so let's take a look again. In this situation, we would do the part on top first and we're multiplying. So we're looking at significant figures. First number here, five has how many significant figures? Does have three, guy next to it has. So when we're done with this, we should end up with three significant figures, right? We're then gonna take that number and divide it by the bottom, which has how many significant figures? Two. We're basically dividing three significant figures by two. Our answer should end up with the least, which is two significant figures in this case. So if you punch that in there up on top, you get something like 1704 divided by two gets you uh, 8.52, which means we should end up here with only two, 8.5, which should be our answer in this particular case. So again, I did not round at any point. Uh, I didn't round the top number to three. I kept the whole number when I did the calculation, but I did keep track of it. Sometimes people will put like a little line up on top. And again, they call that sort of a guard digit. That's kind of where they're supposed to end the number um, and just keep a couple of extra digits. Again, just keep a couple extra digits and you should be okay in terms of rounding error or something like that. Um, and then clean it up at the end. Any questions on that? Yeah, so when you multiply or divide, you're looking at significant figures and it's always the least number of significant figures. And you kind of, if you're doing multiple calculations, you gotta kind of keep track of, okay, first I did this. That means my answer should have this many. And then I took that number and like divided it by this number, then that answer should have that. It's really ultimately the last step that you do in the calculation will ultimately determine where you end up but you also have to keep track of how many everybody should have coming into that last calculation so that you could figure it out, you know, correctly in terms of your answer. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, so just to make sure I understand, so I was thinking if you're going to go with the top number, you would want to you do in this case because it's really a two-step calculation here, right? So at the end is where we typically give our answer, right? At when we're done with all the steps in the calculations, be it if it's like one-step calculation, two-step, three-step, four-step, however many steps of calculations you have, the very final calculation really does determine sort of where you end up. But in order to sort of do that analysis correctly, you have to kind of keep track of all the previous calculations as to really what your number should have as you continue down the path of your calculation. So in this case, because the really the last thing that we did was divide, we were still looking at significant figures. And technically speaking, the last two numbers we divided was a number with three significant figures on top divided with a number with two significant figures on the bottom. And that determines that at the end here, our answer should have two significant figures. Other questions? Okay, uh, so let's continue on here. Uh, so obviously we've been talking about here, uh, multiplying and dividing. This is the one we just got the answer. We also wanna think about a couple other things as well. I think it was 8.5 is what we got, if I'm not mistaken there, uh, for our answer. Yep. So we also want to think about units, right? So if we just look at the units here, uh, we are centimeters times centimeters divided by centimeters, right? So in terms of the units, what should the units end up being in this case? Yeah, it should just be centimeters because basically centimeters on top and centimeters on the bottom cancel each other out, right? It's kind of like two divided by two equals one. It's the same idea. And we're left really with just centimeters, right? So we want to make sure that we do get the right units. By the way, if we just did the top part of the calculation where I think we have 17.04, if we just did this part, what would the units be? It would be centimeters squared, right? Centimeters times centimeters gives us centimeters squared. Uh, so again, don't forget if you're doing some of these calculations, 
Uh, make sure you also keep track of those units because you do need to give, as we talked about last time, uh, the answer with the units um, when you do give it. Any questions on that there? So multiplying, dividing, it is significant figures. It is the least number of significant figures is what your answer should end up being. Now, and you can see here the book got it wrong. There, we'll help them out there. All right. So let's talk about the other sort of operation that's done, uh, which is adding and subtracting. So when you do addition or subtraction in terms of significant figures, you're actually not looking at significant figures when you do adding and subtracting. You're actually looking at decimal places. And your answer should have the same number of decimal places as the number, surprisingly, with the least number of decimal places. So the good news is it's always the smallest but if you're adding and subtracting, you're looking at decimal places, the least number. If you're multiplying and dividing, you're looking at the least number of significant figures. So those are two different things. So here, for example, if we were adding all these numbers together, we end up with this number here on our calculator. This number here has three decimal places. Again, not significant figures. This number here has two decimal places. And this number here has one decimal place. That means our answer should actually go to one decimal place when we're adding here or subtracting. That means that our answer would be in this case 66.1. 66.1 has one decimal place. How many significant figures does it have? It has three, which is important because if you took that number and then multiply it by a number, you wanna then go back and look at significant figures, right? Uh, so when you add and subtract, it is the least number of decimal places is how many decimal places your answer should have. And it's kind of the same idea. It is like really the worst measurement in that case is as good as your calculation is going to be. Out of all these cases, this is our worst of the three measurements. And that is as good as our answer could go to, which is sort of that first decimal place. Any questions on that there? Here again, we're subtracting. So we're looking at decimal places, two decimal places, one decimal place. Number on the calculator means we should go to one decimal place, which is there. The next number is a nine. So again, we need to round. Uh, so we do need to round up. And we will end up with 62.1 in this particular case. All right. So what should the answer be here to the proper digits? Our calculator goes uh, 104.409. Here we are adding. So we're looking at decimal places. So that is three decimal places. That is one decimal place. That means my answer should end up one decimal place. That means my answer here should be 104.4. That has how many significant figures though? It does have four significant figures, right? But one decimal place. Any questions on that one there? go all right so again uh always the least significant figures multiplying dividing adding subtracting decimal places the least again if you do some type of combination you gotta keep track so you know if you had uh four two point three times one three six point oh divided by forty three point zero and then we added it to 1.32. What should the answer be? I don't know either. I'm just making up numbers. Let me try myself. Let's see. So obviously the first thing we would do would be here. And uh, so we'll take out 42.3 times 136. It equals divided by 43. That's going to give us on our calculator 133.786465. Oh, 
we want to think about what we just did here. We multiplied first on top, which means we should look at significant figures. So this number has three. Uh, this number has four, which means our top number really should end up with three significant figures. We then took that top number and divided it by our bottom number, which also has three significant figures. That means technically, if we were stopping the calculation right at this point, our number should have three significant figures, right? Now, again, I'm not really stopping the calculation. I am going to continue on and then add this to it. Uh, so I'm going to add 1.32. I personally probably wouldn't round at this point. You could if you really wanted to, uh, but I'm just going to add the 1.32. That's going to give me a 135.1060465. Now, technically speaking, where should my answer end up? So really, this guy is actually a whole number, right? And the last thing I did was add something with no decimal places to something with two decimal places, which means, technically speaking, my answer should have no decimal places, right? That was the very last thing that I did in that particular case, yeah? So you do want to keep track of what's going on. And remember, obviously, if you're adding a whole number, the smallest number of decimal places is no decimal places, right? So you would take it to the whole number, right? Because technically, that would actually be your worst measurement there because your whole number, the uncertainty there is in the first place, right? The ones digit, uh, while your uncertainty in the other measurements in the hundreds place. Any question on addition? Yeah. In this case, personally, if I were to do this, I would have just uh, rolled with the whole number on my calculator because I would have just done the first math part and then hit the addition button and add uh, 1.32 to it. Um, I'm not necessarily against that in this particular case. If you did add, I don't think you would be terribly uh, that far off of where we ended up. So uh, you would end up on your calculator if you rounded and added this. 135.32, which you would still take to 135, a whole number. So you could in this case, but if you're probably doing this calculation with your calculator, you would roll through the first calculation, hit equals, and then add the next number to it. And again, uh, you, you won't get really too much rounding errors, but you could in this case kind of get an answer and then do the next step. I think it would be okay. I probably would still maybe keep an extra digit or two, you know, maybe not round super much, uh, but it, you'll get pretty close to the same number. Other questions? Yeah. And th in this case, we wouldn't because technically speaking, the result of this part of the calculation was a whole number really is what it should end. So if there was no second part to the calculation, that number that you should end up with technically would have been 134 would have been your answer. And 134 has no decimal places, which then when you add it, which is the last math step that you did, which is adding, we now have to switch from significant figures to decimal places. And that 134 technically has no decimal places which is less decimal places than the second guy there that has two. And that's why we should end up with a whole number when it's all said and done. So you do have to kind of keep track of everything along the way and clean it up at the end. Yeah. It would technically be wrong in terms of if you were going for obviously significant figures and stuff like that. It's correct in terms is correct in a sense in terms of the value of the number, right? And the math part of it. But in terms of giving it to sort of the proper number of significant figures and stuff like that, that part of it would be a correct. No. Yeah. Why did I run three before? Because technically when we did the top part here, uh, we should have ended up with three significant figures. And this was the number I got on my calculator, three significant figures to here. But we have to look at the seven in this case, right? No, that was just the math of the first part here. So the very first thing we did was this part where we multiplied, right? So we have to look at significant figures for just the top part of that calculation. And that should have gave us three significant figures when we we're done with the top part. We then divided the top part, which was three significant figures by this bottom number, 
which was also three significant figures. So since we're dividing, we're looking at significant figures, which means the answer that we get for just the part over here is this. And just following significant figure rules, if we were to end the calculation at that point, it should have three significant figures, which would take us to this three here. And then we have to look at the seven. And that technically would be, if you were to round at that point, that's what you should round to is 134. But then the last part of the calculation we did was the adding part, which we then have to switch to now decimal places and look at the smallest number of decimal places. So we do have to sort of have an idea of what this number should be when it's all said and done to know for the last part of the calculation how many decimal places it has, right? So we know that technically if we were to give an answer, it should be 134, which has no decimal places. And that's an important piece of information to know for the last part of the calculation where you're adding it to the next number that has decimal places, right? Because you got to look at those decimal places. Other questions? Okay. All right. So obviously when we do calculations involving significant figures, we always want to give the answer to the proper number of digits. And again, it is depending on what you're doing, either multiplying and dividing or adding and subtracting. But again, always the least. Sig figs for the multiplying and dividing, decimal places for the adding and subtracting. And if you come across an exact number, you don't have really have to worry about it in terms of significant figures. Any questions on calculations? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some conversions and prefixes. So what it, as I mentioned before, inequality is really something, but are on different units. And we have some example, kilometer and meter, millimeter and unit and base unit of language to understand uh, what if I had kilometers, kilo is a prefix and that's a prefix unit. The base unit to kilometers is actually the base unit of meters, right? So that is the base unit to that. Meters, you could have meters, right? You could have centimeters, kilometers, uh, millimeters, those are all prefix type units that you have. Uh, you could have something like, again, like a millimeter. The base unit here is a meter. You could have like a milliliter. The base unit is a liter. You could have a kiloliter. Base unit would be a liter. You could have a centigram. Base unit would be a gram. You could have a milligram. Base unit would be a gram. So a lot of times when we look at prefixes, we use them to help us with the meaning. And there's a couple of different meanings, like one kilometer is equal to a thousand uh, meters. Kilo basically means a thousand in this case. One milliliter, millimeter is equal to 0 0.001 meters. So the prefix doesn't really matter. It's the same sort of conversion regardless of the unit. So if you have a kilometer, one kilometer is a thousand meters, one kiloliter is a thousand liters, one kilogram is a thousand grams. So again, kilo basically means a thousand in this case is one way that you could look at it. And the base unit in each of these cases, meter is the base unit, liter is the base unit, and grams are the base unit in each of these sort of qualities. Again, each of these are qualities. Each of these represent the same amount of those things, uh, just on different units. So we oftentimes have a table where we use these prefixes and the meanings of these things. So there's our kilo, and it is 10 to the 3. And that is basically scientific notation of 1 times 10 to the 3. And I would say when people look at this table that's in your book and you got a bunch of them like deci is 10 there to the minus one, you have centi, which is 10 to the minus two. And again, that is one times 10 to the minus two if you needed to punch that into your calculator. I would say when people go to a table like this, 
it is very common that people always do these kind of conversions backwards. So let's talk about what these values here represent. So if you had centi and you look up on a table like this and it says centi is 10 to the minus two, which again is basically scientific notation of one times 10 to the minus two. If you needed to punch it into your calculator, that is how you would punch it in. Like we talked about punching in scientific notation as one times 10 to the minus two. What that means, for example, if you have the prefix unit, say centimeters, and the base unit of meters, when you look at something like this, that is how much there is in the base unit to one of the prefix units. So that means in one centimeter, there is 10 to the minus two meters. Can't tell you how many people will write it backwards and go, there's 10 to the minus two centimeters in one meter, and that is incorrect. By the way, if I have one centigram, there would be 10 to the minus two grams in one centigram. If I had one centiliter, there would be 10 to the minus two liters. It doesn't matter what the base unit is, but when you see like 10 to the minus two, 10 to the three for kilo, that is how much there is in the base unit to one of the prefix units. So for example, if we had our kilo there, which is 10 to the three, in one of the prefix units, like one kilometer, I have 10 to the three meters. If I had one kiloliter, I would have 10 to the three liters, right? And again, it's important to make sure that you sort of use those correctly. So for example here, nano, right, is 10 to the minus nine. Should be right about there, I think. So you fill in it correctly. We have meters, actually I'll go this way, I'll go put it here maybe. Meters and nanometers. So fill it in correctly if you wanted to use it. Liters and nanoliters. Yeah. So it would be 10 to the minus 9 meters and 1 nanometer. That, again, is the correct way to do that. Liters and the second one is the base unit. So there would be 10 to the minus 9 liters and 1 nanoliter. Yeah. And again, it's super common. People always kind of put the number in the wrong spot question on that there. I would say kilo comes up a lot, milli, centi, not too much nano in here, but uh, definitely kilo, milli, centi, you know, those guys do come up a lot. So how do we use this? So for example, if we had nano, which is 10 to the minus nine, right? And let's just say we had 464 nanometers, and we want to know how many meters that would be. Yeah. So what we would want to do in this case is we would want to use this as really a conversion factor and do a calculation to do this. And the way that we show calculations in chemistry is what is known as dimensional analysis. And what dimensional analysis basically does and the way you should set up your problems We'll talk more about it later on, but the way you should set up your problems is doing it this way. It can also help you in certain cases, not to necessarily have to know a formula, but if you just kind of keep track of units, which is pretty much what dimensional analysis does, it allows you to maybe do some calculations that, you know, you may not have to know a actual uh, equation for. So what is the idea? The idea is you have some type of conversion factor, like you know, 4A equals 3B, and they're equal to each other, whatever those units are, right? So what happens is you could come from this equality, you could write two conversion factors, which in this case would be 4A over 3B, or 3B over 4A. And it's really just a fraction where you put one on top, one on the bottom, numerator, denominator, and then flip it around, numerator, denominator. So let's just say, for example, we had five of A 
and we wanted to know, you know, how many B would that be? The way that we would want to set this up is we would start with what was given to us, which is 5A. Now, I think we talked about math earlier in that first chapter. And really, the idea here is we want to get rid of the units that we do not want. And we want to end up with the units that we do want. So in this case, we actually want to get rid of A. And we want to end up with B as our units, right? Because we want to know how many B we have. So it's always opposite in terms of how we get rid of it. And when you do dimensional analysis, you want to put the unit you want to get rid of in the opposite location. So although it's not written like a fraction, my unit of A is technically up on top, right? It's over one, basically. Which means if I want to get rid of A, I need to put it in the opposite location, which means A needs to go on the bottom. Which conversion factor here, which are what these are, conversion factors, is A on the bottom? It is the one on the right, right? So if I do that, I put 3B up on top, 4A on the bottom. This is what is dimensional analysis. We're basically showing the units. We're going to use conversion factors to cancel things out. Mathematically, what we are doing is anything that's on top, we multiply. Anything on the bottom gets divided, basically. Okay. So in this case, what happens is we take the top, which is in this example here, 5 times 3, which is 15, divided by 4, which is on the bottom, gives us 3.75. Now, in terms of the units, what happens is because A is on top and A is on the bottom, they cancel each other out because essentially we're dividing them and it becomes one. Again, like if you divide a two by two, it equals one. And so if you have the same unit on top and the same unit on the bottom, they cancel each other out. The only unit left at this point is B and it's on top, which is good because that is what I want. This is basically what dimensional analysis is. We set up problems using conversion factors to get rid of the units that we don't want. We keep the units that we do want and we get those conversion factors from like equalities a lot of times so we could do that. First off, any questions on the general calculation there? All right, so now coming back to sort of the one with some real numbers here, let's take a look and see uh, what we would do in this case. So if we look at this, we want to go from 464 nanometers and we want to figure out how many meters does that represent? So we want to come up with really an equality that's going to help us do that. And that table that we just looked at is something that will allow us to do that. We basically have nano, which is 10 to the minus 9. So in one of the prefix units, there is 10 to the minus 9 of the base unit, which is meters in this case. That would be our equality, by the way. That will give us two conversion factors. So whenever you have an equality, it gives you two conversion factors, one nanometer over 10 to the minus nine meters, or you could flip it around the other way, 10 to the minus nine meters is one nanometer. And again, these are conversion factors. Will you use all the conversion factors in your calculation? The answer is no, you're just gonna pick the one that you need, right? So we're going to start with the number that was given to us, which was 464 nanometers. Again, here it is not really written as a fraction, but you could think of it as a fraction if you want. That means my nanometers are up on top. I want to get rid of nanometers. That means I should use the conversion factor there on the left or right to do that. Which one is the nanometers in the opposite location? It is the one on the right. That is the one where it's on the opposite location. We're going to set that up so we can see the units, which is how they want you to do your work here in chemistry. Once again, nanometers divided by nanometers will cancel each other out. Mathematically, we're going to multiply what's on top, come back and divide by what's on the bottom. Once again, 10 to the minus nine is basically one times 10 to the minus nine on your calculator if you need to punch it in that way. So you would take uh, 464 times 
1 times 10 to the minus 9. And that is going to give you an answer of 0 0.0000064. Not a lot of zeros there. <laughs> Two, four, six zeros we'll go with there. <laughs> a lot. Perhaps something we might want to do a little scientific notation action on, by the way. By the way, the units of the leftover in this case is meters. This would be... 4.64 times 10 to the minus 7 meters in this particular case. So this is the proper way to do it. In this case, you would take 464. Again, you would times it by 1 times 10 to the minus 9, punch it in correctly in scientific notation in your calculator. In this case, you really don't have to divide by the bottom because it's all one. It'll give you the same answer. If you did have a number on the bottom, you would divide. Now, if you had a bunch of numbers on the bottom, uh, you would divide by each number individually, hit equals every time, and that will give you the right answer. So nano is a smaller number or smaller unit than meters. And that's why, as you can see, it's a very, very small amount of meters, right? Like 464 nanometers question on that there why don't you try one let's just say we had uh we had centi as we saw on that table right centi is uh 10 to the minus two right so we want to know how many uh we'll go with uh centigrams there are and We'll go with uh, 4,256 grams. All right, so let's take a look at this one here and see. Um, <clears throat> So in this case, uh, we're looking at centigrams, we have grams. So using this correctly tells us that in one of the prefix, which in this case is centigrams, there is 10 to the minus two grams. This again, uh, is the proper way to do that. This gives us uh, our two conversion factors. One centigram is 10 to the minus two grams our uh, 10 to the minus two grams is one centigram. By the way, this is also the same conversion if you divide 10 to the minus two to both sides. This will give you 100 centigrams equals one gram. So again, if you like the bigger number, that is how you get the bigger number, but make sure that you sort of do it correctly. Here, we're gonna start with our uh, four, two, five, six cent, uh, grams. In this case, grams are up on top. So we want grams on the bottom, which means in this case, we're actually going to roll with the guy on the left here. That's gonna give us one centigram divided by 10 to the minus two grams. Grams on top, grams on the bottom will cancel. In this case, we're basically multiplying by one, which you really don't need to do. You're then gonna basically take this number and divide it by what's on the bottom here. So we're going to take four, two, five, six divided by basically one times 10 to the minus two. That's going to give me a four, two, five, six, zero, zero centigrams. First off, any question on that calculation? Again, you could punch this in. This is basically one times 10 to the minus two scientific notation in your calculator. Yeah. Question on that there. Let's talk significant figures. This right here is a metric to metric conversion, which means it is an exact number, which means I'm not going to worry about it in terms of significant figures. That means that really the only number that's outside of that in the calculation is our original number. And that original number has how many significant figures? It has four significant figures, right? That means our answer should have, as it does here, 
or significant figures based off of that number. Again, that conversion there is an exact number, so you would ignore it in terms of the calculation. Um, by the way, that's the same thing here. That is an exact number. So you don't have to worry about it. That means that really this number here has three significant figures. And since all we're doing when you do dimensional analysis is multiply and divide, we're always looking at significant figures like we talked about when we multiply and divide. That is why we ended up with three significant figures here in each of these cases. Yeah. Any questions on that there? So let's talk about what happens if you wanted to go from... Let's say you had uh, something, 45. Let's say you had 45 kilometers and you wanted to know how many millimeters that is. So we're going to use our couple of conversions we get from that table. Kilo is 10 to the three. Once again, if we look at that table, we we're looking at a second ago, uh, milli is right there, 10 to the minus three there, I think. Okay, so let's take a look at, since we're kind of getting to the end. So this is a very common error a lot of people make, which is we're really here going prefix to prefix, right? And people want to always do it in one step because, you know, they're used to popping their phone open and going Google. Tell me how many kilometers are a millimeter, right? Pretty much. By the way, you won't have your phone available to you on quizzes and exams, so you can't do that. You can't even ask your watch because you shouldn't have that on either. So you do need a way to be able to do this, right? And there's a song I know that, that you could do or something people tell me from prefix to prefix. I have no idea about that. But I think the smartest thing that you should do is use what's going to be available to you. So what is available to you probably will be something like this table that we were looking at here where it says kilos 10 to the three or milli is 10 to the minus three. So whenever you're sort of going from what I like to call like a prefix unit to another prefix unit, what ties both of those together is the base unit, right? We have kilometers and millimeters. The base unit is meters. That is your one that basically ties both of those together. You can very easily, by using that table we just looked at, figure out how to go from kilometers back to the base unit. And then once you have it back at meters, you can also use the table to then take it back to the next. So I highly recommend, and I've known in my experience that when people just try to move decimal places, they always move the wrong way and not the right number of places. By the way, you do need to show your work. So just moving decimal places on a problem like this will not get you all the credit. You will need to show it with dimensional analysis like we kind of been doing in these calculations. So that would be my recommendation. You kind of go prefix to prefix, take it back to the base unit, take it from the base unit to the next prefix unit because you can find those conversions really, really easily. So we'll just start with the first part of it, which is we just want to think about taking kilometers back to meters. So that is our kilo conversion we can find on that table. And again, that means in one kilometer, there is 10 to the three meters, right? So that is our equality that we could get from that table. That's going to give us our two options for conversion factors. Which again are just fractions, right? So if we just did the uh, first part of the calculation, can over it see kilometer. Factor here on the right, right? It has the kilometers in the opposite location. You actually, if you wanted to, could continue on with the calculation, but we'll just kind of do it in steps here. And if we did get an answer at this point, we would take 45 times basically 1 times 10 to the 3. 
and that's going to give you 45,000. Our units would be meters as the kilometers on top and bottom would cancel. This would be the only unit that is left standing at this point. We have now successfully got to this guy, right? Yeah. So we're halfway there. We now need to take it from meters to millimeters, which again, we could find by using our table there. And we could use this. So what that means in terms of that is in one of the prefix unit, which is millimeters, there is 10 to the minus three of the base unit, which is our meters, which is our equality, right? And that means that would give us two conversion factors, one millimeter over 10 to the minus three meters, our 10 to the minus three meters is one millimeter, and those are our conversion factors. We will take the number that we got from the first part of the calculation, four, five, zero, zero, zero meters. By the way, the meters are still up on top, right? Whenever you get an answer to one unit, that unit should be up on top. That means to use the opposite. In this case, we're going to go with the guy on the left to do that. That's going to be 10 to the minus 3 meters is 1 millimeter. In this case, we're going to multiply, which you really don't need to do because it's 1. And then we're going to divide here what's on the bottom. So we're basically going to take our 45,000 divided by 1 times 10 to the minus 3. And that's going to give us 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I think I lost track there. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And the units here, meters would cancel. Millimeters would be here. That would give us 4.5 times 10 to the 7 millimeters if we wrote in scientific notation. Millimeters is a smaller unit to kilometers, and that's why there's so much of it there, right? 4.5 times 10 to the minus 3. Now, in terms of significant figures, that's an equality, an exact number. We don't have to worry about it. That is an equality, an exact number. We don't have to worry about it. The only number that has significant figures, technically, we need to worry about is our original number, which is two. And that is why we ended up with two significant figures for our answer. First off, any questions on that there? Uh, in terms of the, in terms of the order, the kilo and something, it does in this case. So, for example, if we uh, it was forty five, right? You could have done it all at one, all in one calculation, but you do have to start with the kilo because that was the original unit. So you do have to kind of start with that one. You could have done the one kilometer is ten to the minus uh, ten to the three meters, and you could have done it all as all one calculation. And this is the benefit of dimensional analysis. Because if I was to continue on, I could now clearly see my meters are still up on top. So I just got a no-brainer and go opposites, right, to get rid of it. And again, that was our 10 to the minus 3 meters is a millimeter up on top. And you could do it all in one calculation if you want, where you would be multiplying whatever's on top, dividing by whatever's on the bottom. Yeah, yep. And in this case, if you did... You do have to do it in that order because that was the first unit that we're starting with. All right, everybody have a seat for a second. Yeah, relax. Any questions on any of that stuff there? Yeah. Okay.